I'm a simple lawyer, so I have very simple slides. <laughs> I hope you will forgive me. How do we create the society that we want to live in? A central feature of any society is how its members engage with each other. And as anyone who has found themselves in a public space, in a group of people, knows that human interactions don't always go smoothly all by themselves. So we need to set parameters. And one of the key foundations for regulating the way we interact with each other is setting norms. Norms can take many shapes and forms, but in most societies this will include adopting legislation. But this is not enough. Creating norms or adopting laws is not sufficient. You can have the most beautiful laws, the most well-articulated set of norms, but if they are not being implemented or enforced, the practical reality could potentially be nil. Literally, a paper tiger. Of course, there are many other complications. While in a democracy, we ideally elect those who govern us, not all legislation will always reflect what we want our society to look like. And even if it does reflect the way we want the world to look, normative debates and legislation cannot always keep up with rapid societal and technological change. In other words, our sets of norms and our laws can be out of sync with reality in many ways. How norms are lived or applied in practice, therefore, is crucial. And there are many different ways in which we can ensure that legislation and other norms become a practical reality. And sometimes we can even use those methods to ensure that some norms or rules that we do not want to, that we do not agree with, do not become reality. Civil society plays a crucial role in this process. Through advocacy, campaigning and lobbying, they can push for the implementation of existing norms that we want to see lived in practice or push for change of the ones that we do not want. One other avenue is using the courts as a guarantor of norms and even as a tool for change, which is the focus of my talk today. The courts can be, an important, can be important guarantors of our rights and norms, and there are numerous ways and numerous examples of situations in which they provided the type of protection that the legislator was unable or unwilling to provide. And I will highlight two here. First, I'll start with an example from the US. Same-sex marriage had been recognized under the law in 11 European countries when it still wasn't the case in the United States. I'm proud to say that the country of my uh, primary nationality, the Netherlands, was the first to legislate for marriage equality in 2001. Many other countries followed suit, but the United States did not. Until in June 2015, the US Supreme Court decided in the case of Obergefell versus Hodge that no union is more profound than marriage, for it embodies the highest ideals of love, fidelity, devotion, sacrifice, and family. In forming a marital union, two people become something greater than once they were. The petitioner's hope is not to be condemned to live in loneliness, excluded from one of civilization's oldest institutions. They ask for equal dignity in the eyes of the law. The Constitution grants them that right. There, where the legislator refused to advance equal marriage rights for all, in line with shifting opinions in society on this point, the court stepped in. Enabled by a long and strategic litigation, advocacy and diplomacy campaign to make this possible. The second, perhaps slightly less well-known example is Malone versus the United Kingdom, where the European Court of Human Rights ruled that phone tapping without an express basis in a law that indicated with reasonable clarity the scope and manner of exercise of the relevant discretion conferred on the public authorities was a violation of the right to privacy. This resulted in the UK putting in place a law that required a warrant before communications could be intercepted. And this judgment is central to past and present litigation against state mass surveillance regimes, including the European court cases against surveillance regimes in Russia, Hungary, Sweden, and the United Kingdom. These are two examples that illustrate how the courts can help us guarantee our rights and freedoms where the legislator lets us down. This includes bringing our normative framework in line with changes in society and protecting us from violations of our rights due to a failing legal framework or sometimes even a total absence of legislation. For courts to exercise this role, they need to be given the opportunity. They have to have cases brought before them 
and cases can end up in court by chance or with an intended purpose or a specific aim. We will now take a closer look at the situations when cases can help bring about bigger social change, strategic litigation. What is referred to as strategic litigation comes with a variety of labels. Impact litigation, tactical litigation, test case litigation, public interest litigation, and my favorite, uh, radical lawyering. <laughs> there are also many definitions that describe what this kind of litigation means, each with a different focus on specific aspects of the litigation work being done. Labels can of course matter, and I'm very happy for anyone who's interested in how they can be relevant to chat further about that after this talk. But for now, I want to focus on three main characteristics that are common to using litigation as an instrument for change and that make a court case strategic. The first element is that the case is aimed at bringing about change. This can look at many different things. It can be a change in law, it can be a change in the application and implementation of the law, or it can be a change in the wider policies around a specific issue. The second factor is that the impact of the case is intended to go beyond the individual or group acting as claimants, or those bringing the case. The case is not just litigated to get results for those who brought the case, but for a broader group. And third, the case is part of a wider strategy or movement. And this last element is crucial. Litigation that is strategic is more than just a court case alone. It is one of the many tools in the toolbox that is used for creating the society we want. And it's employed in tandem with other efforts such as advocacy, lobbying, and campaigning. Strategic litigation can be a helpful tool for working on a, towards a variety of goals, including establishing a, changing, a change in law or policy, as we have seen in a Digital Rights Ireland case that was won before the Court of Justice of the European Union, which held that the Data Retention Directive, which forced internet and telecom providers to collect a variety of personal data from its users and retain those for a period from six months up to two years, was invalid under EU law. It can also be used to challenge practice, as we saw in a US case brought by a number of teachers from Houston against the use of a statistical model called the Education Value Added Assessment System, or AVAS, that was used to assess teachers' performance. This model was used as the basis for 221 teacher dismissals in one year, despite the system being opaque, flawed, and fragile. The case was settled before it could go to full trial, but as part of the settlement, the Houston Independent Schools District reportedly agreed to seize the use of the model to make personnel decisions. Another objective of strategic litigation can be truth-telling and transparency. And here I can point to some exciting litigation that has sought to get access to information on algorithms used by government institutions, including algorithms used to assign cases to judges and to conduct welfare needs assessments. Another goal is setting safeguards for our rights. Max Schrems' work in challenging the transfer of his data and that of EU citizens to the US by Facebook is worth mentioning here. Work which resulted in the invalidation of the Safe Harbor Agreement in 2015. This arrangement governed, at the time, data transfers between the EU and the US. This battle is ongoing with his new challenge to the EU-US Privacy Shield. And finally, another goal that can be pursued is raising public awareness about problematic issues within our society, such as the challenge brought by the NGO Liberty in the United Kingdom to the police use of facial recognition has done. It's a case that is currently on appeal. All of these objectives are applicable in our current context, where automated decision making is just one of the many new frontiers we and our legislators need to keep up with. The courts need to keep up with all of these new developments as well, and, as the guarantors of our rights, we need to take them with us in this changing landscape and give them the opportunity to engage with these issues. In doing so, we need to make sure that we give the courts an opportunity to engage with the changing landscape in a meaningful way. One way to increase the chances of that happening is by carefully choosing our objectives for litigation. So what can we litigate on and what should we litigate on? 
The choice of battle can define whether you can win or not and whether you can win in the right way. Defining the right scope for a strategic case is crucial. Let me illustrate this with two examples, one of litigation overreach and one in which incremental change was achieved through many small steps. So we looked at the U.S. Supreme Court's decision in Obergefell just now as an example where a court brought the legal framework in line with changing norms in society. That decision was the result of a carefully crafted strategy that unfolded over a longer period of time after a previous direct bid to get gay marriage recognized as a constitutional right in 1971, Baker v. Nelson, was unsuccessful. I do not know if litigators in Europe uh, failed to learn from that 1971 effort or if they thought that the landscape here in Europe was fundamentally different from that in the US. But the first case that reached the uh, European Court of Human Rights in 2010 that tried to uh, establish same-sex marriage, Schalk and Kopp versus Austria, was unsuccessful, with the court finding that the right to marry under the convention does not oppose, impose an obligation on the respondent government to grant a same-sex couple, such as the applicants, access to marriage. Campaigners and lobbyists definitely learned from it, and most legislative progress on same-sex marriage in Europe has since been the result of careful campaigning and lobbying work. And litigators also learned from it. They paid attention, and in the cases that were subsequently brought, the court has slowly delivered strong and stronger decisions on civil unions for same-sex couples, and hopefully someday it will also recognize same-sex marriage under the right to marry, like the US Supreme Court has done. A great example of a carefully crafted uh, strategy for incremental change that I would like to highlight is also from the US, namely the death penalty litigation work that continues until this very day. A number of organizations work on this issue, but they carefully coordinate their strategies with each other, working towards a joint goal. By starting with core challenges to the execution of juveniles and those with disabilities, litigation then focused on the mandatory death penalty, the death row phenomenon, methods of execution, and racial discrimination in death penalty sentencing, before a head-on challenge to the death penalty itself was filed. This challenge was successful, by the way, but subsequently overturned by legislation, which unfortunately is not an uncommon phenomenon. And that's the reason why this important work continues until today. But by slowly chipping away at the block, starting with the battles that they had a good chance of winning, and then moving on to the next station, they managed to achieve a result that nearly certainly would not have been possible to achieve with one giant leap. What these offline examples teach us is that while time can be of the essence, especially when we are dealing with rapid technological and social change, taking a moment to thoroughly consider what we have a good chance of successfully taking on can make the difference between the litigation helping advance our rights and setting us a step back. When looking at litigation objectives for algorithmic decision making, we can make a distinction between two main categories, regulation, or how do we make the use of algorithmic decision-making fair, accountable, and transparent, and drawing so-called red lines. So should we be using AI at all? Red lines do not appear to be the focus of debate for litigators at the moment, and I'm wondering why there is not more discussion or even agreement on this issue. One of the few proposals I've come across is Germany's Data Ethics Commission, which has suggested a complete or partial ban on AI applications with an untenable potential for harm. This, outs, this sets out very broad parameters to define where we should draw the line, but I have not yet come across a concise setting out or mapping of the various considerations that come into play when thinking about possible avenues for litigation. This is a shame, I think as it is very much where the foundational question of what the society we want to live in should look like takes center stage, and it's definitely a debate that ethicists should very much be a part of. It is a fundament fundamental question on how we want to shape certain processes in our society, and once we have a clear vision of where the boundaries lie, then we can litigate to ensure that these boundaries are also adhered to. Litigation that looks at regulation 
will help define what fairness, accountability and transparency look like in practice by helping us define safeguards for the use of algorithmic solutions. Questions we could get clarified through litigation include what effective oversight looks like or what human rights impact assessments should contain in practice. In short, how do we make sure the safeguards that are written into legislation and regulation are meaningful, effective and protect our rights in practice? At this point in time, there are not yet good case examples to draw upon, but an analogy can serve as an example of what might happen when existing standards of fairness, transparency and accountability are applied to a new context. Many of you will be familiar with the Carpenter case, a case in which the Electronic Frontier Foundation intervened with an amicus brief. In this case, the Supreme Court held that if the police wanted to access cell site location information from a cell phone company, so the information uh, about, that is gathered by a cell phone's communication with cell towers needed a warrant, so it required prior authorization from a judge. This was a modern day application of the US Constitution's Fourth Amendment protection, which protects citizens from unseasonable, unreasonable searches and seizures. The Carpenter case illustrates not only how we can use litigation to get clarity on parameters for regulation, but also how the courts can play an important role in applying existing frameworks in a new context. Because an often heard response to new technological developments is to adopt new legislation, but we do not always need that to make sure that our society remains a just one. We first need to properly investigate what frameworks and tools we already have and consider how we can make optimal use of them. As mentioned before, the courts can play a crucial role in applying existing frameworks or legislation. The legislature might tr struggle to keep up with the developments, but as things stand, laws are often drafted in a tech-neutral way, giving the courts leeway to make these situation-specific adaptations themselves. In order to do so, we need to give the courts a chance. So we can have a look now at the frameworks that we already have that can be of use to litigate issues of fairness, accountability and transparency. <coughs> a recent and often mentioned during this framework, but still fairly underutilized framework in litigation is of course the GDPR or General Data Protection Regulation. It offers a number of entry points for litigating on not only regulation, but also the issue of red lines. For example, Article 22, which says that unless they give explicit consent or there's a contractual or legal basis, data subjects have a right not to be subjected to a decision based solely on automated processing, including profiling, if this has legal effects that affect them. <coughs> this, for example, could be a basis to challenge automated systems that autonomously make certain determinations against us. These can be systems that automatically dismiss our applications in the hiring process, something was alluded to in one of the conversations yesterday, change our credit score or censor our online content. Article 5.1c limits the scope of data that are allowed to be processed by AI systems. They cannot process more than is necessary for the purposes that the data were originally collected. This could assist in litigating on, for example, systems that feed off a disproportionate number of data points to achieve their objectives. Article 5.1d, which requires that systems do not process inaccurate or old or out-of-date data, could be used to challenge systems that make inaccurate inferences about identifiable individuals from seemingly unrelated data. But then there are other numerous frameworks that can be applicable, depending on the context in which we're operating. There are industry or sector specific laws, and some of these might be limited to a specific type of technology, such as aviation law or self-driving car legislation, but it could be helpful frameworks in imposing liability and securing accountability for harm caused by systems that are used in these specific contexts. However, other more tech neutral laws, such as those around due process, public procurement and product liability could also play a role in remedying rights violations caused by the use of AI. Anti-discrimination legislation, such as the U UK Equality Act, could be an entry point from, for example, challenging systems that are used by employers or public bodies that treat people differently or disadvantage them based on issues of age, disability, gender, ethnicity, nationality, sexual orientation, and the like. 
And finally, administrative law, which was not my favorite in law school, but it can also provide opportunities to ensure that AI-driven decisions made by the public sector are fair, transparent, relevant, and understandable. Here we can think of cases applying the duty to give reasons in the context of algorithm-assisted decision-making by public bodies. I'm getting the curse of the yeah, clicker. <laughs> These are exciting times. The landscape continues to evolve in dizzying pace and even tech skeptics will sometimes have to marvel at what has become possible or appears to be within reach. The possibilities seem endless, but we have to ensure that we safeguard our human rights in the process. The courts can be an important guarantor for this if we give them the opportunity to play this role. In doing so, we need to be as entrepreneurial as we are in pursuing further technological change. This means being creative and using the frameworks that we have and being strategic in what we pursue in the courts and how. That way, together, we can truly build the society we want. Thank you. Thank you, Nani, that was fantastic. Um, so we would obviously like to have questions from the room, but Nani and I thought we would take a few minutes to dive into her talk and talk a little bit more about some of the, the key points she was making and draw them out. Um, so, so maybe a place to start is to, to dig into this idea of um, when is strategic litigation useful? Is it a silver bullet? What are, the, what are the conditions for change that you need to have in place to, for it to be really effective? I would love to say that it's a silver bullet, but uh, sadly it is not. Um, as, I, as I pointed to in my talk, um, strategic litigation can be an effective tool if it's properly embedded in a broader strategy for social change. And uh, what I mean by that is that um, the efforts that you uh, make in court are well connected with other efforts outside of the courtroom. So um, advocacy work, making sure there's sufficient public awareness of the issue that you're litigating on, also with policymakers, so policy work, sometimes the inside track um, uh, in government, and all of these things kind of have to come together. Um, if you just get a really nice president uh, from the court, a nice decision, and that, for example, there's no social support for the issue that you're trying to pursue, you're going to have a really hard time implementing that later on. So it, it, it all has to come together in, in a perfect world. Great, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna circle back and, and ask you about enforcement later, but um, another point that you made was about the, the balance between um, the creative use of existing law and when we need to write new laws. And I wonder if you could say a little bit more about that balance and, and whether the focus should be on, on new law or on existing law. So th there are definitely situations in which it's helpful to come up with new rules. Um, but I, I still think it's always really worthwhile first properly exploring the frameworks that we do have also because they help clarify where the gaps are in the current landscape. So what are we missing from our current legislation and regulation that needs to be clarified and that cannot be picked up by the courts? Um, as I try to kind of point to, the courts can be quite creative in, adapt, in using older frameworks to new situations. Um, and at times, it's just not possible. And that, those are the parts basically that it's then also helpful that the courts can point us out so the legislator knows where to go. Um, and then there's also, if you do adopt new legislation, there's an interesting role also for litigators to follow up on that, kind of how do you make indeed those rules uh, and those regulations a reality in practice. Uh, and that can really help 
with the implementation of the obligations that uh, those pieces of legislation in the end prescribe. And, and can I follow up on that and ask you, um, are, there, are there places right now where you see specific existing gaps? And, um, and how do you see that in the context of the US law versus EU law, which of course are quite, quite different at this point? Now, I guess um, the classic would be a privacy regulation. I mean, uh, we're very proud of uh, our GDPR here. Um, and uh, yeah, the, the, the landscape in the US obviously looks, looks very differently. But I think also um, some of the things that were pointed out also during some of the panels earlier this week um, in the difference in interpretation of non-discrimination issues, etc. So those are also things that we kind of need to figure out, like wh where does that balance lie and do what we have, you know, is that, is that adequate or not? And then are some of these uh, things also adequate for two, two different, very fundamentally different settings in that regard? Um, so, yeah, and then there's the question, of course, like how do you, how do you use it? Um, I pointed to a number of, of US examples because uh, there's a really strong tradition in doing this type of work, in embedding litigation in broader strategies for social change and in social movements, um, and really properly you know, deploying the tool of litigation in that regard. And that is something that is also happening in Europe, but is um, in uh, some of these areas, slightly less further development, developed than it is in the US at this stage. So, so let's turn back to talking a little bit about enforcement and um, essentially thinking about the question of when we win, what happens next? Um, what do we need to have in place to ensure that um, that, that case law is enacted and that, um, that norms are changing socially and culturally? So I had an interesting conversation with, with my colleague yesterday uh, who uh, said that the work begins when you have the judgment. I, I like to think that there's some work before it also. But, um, uh, <laughs> but it, is, it is where you kind of uh, see how important it is that the effort is interconnected with others. Um, in a perfectly ideal setting, you have a coalition and you have a group of different organizations that want to kind of achieve this, the same type of change and different parts of that coalition kind of kick into action in different stages in that process. So the lawyers might be slightly more prominent in the courtroom, but for implementation, when you're actually going to have to see if the change in policy, change in behavior, change in legislation is being followed up on, you very much will have to rely on those who uh, can help you monitor whether or not that change is taking place. Uh, engage with public advocacy, uh, engage with uh, perhaps pressuring the legislator, um, and also then at some points maybe you need the lawyers again because you might have to do some follow-up litigation. So it, it's, it's basically a continuum if, if you look at it that way. You start working on an issue, litigation can be a helpful tool at a certain stage for it, and then together with the other parties you actually make sure that what you're trying to achieve also actually happens. It's very iterative, in other words, and it's something where there's a series of, of handoffs and relationships and um, coordination that has to happen among um, a number of different actors, including, I think, from people in this room. Absolutely. <laughs> um, so we have a lot of people lined up to ask questions, so maybe we'll turn to the room. To, go ahead. Hi, uh, my name is David Kai. Um, I, I really love the, the spirit of what you're saying, um, but I, I can't help but feel like there's a, a, a missing piece of what you're talking about, which is the, the very real aspect of money um, in litigation, especially when it comes to technology. Um, and, and what I think what's different now, um, you know, versus the other sort of big movements of change is um, how much more uh, more money is being spent into sort of litigation, right, and, and lawyer um, and lawyering up specifically. Um, you know, tech companies having armies of, of lawyers and then even more sort of larger armies of lobbyists who are creating different laws. And so I guess as someone who's, who's coming, you know, you from an uh, um, advocacy side, you know, what, 
I don't know how to say this, but how, why should we feel sort of optimistic, right? Like when there's such an imbalance of, of resources, um, at least in, on the American side, um, and, and what's the sort of call to action, right? Does it mean sort of channeling more resources towards, you know, the ACLUs of the world? Um, and, and, and yeah, how, when, you, when you're talking about litigation, right, how do we, how do we think about money and resources? Thank you, and uh, I'm going to uh, call you when I'm making my next pitch to, uh, pitch to our funders, because uh, that was a very eloquent way of explaining why we all need more cash. Um, I agree with you. This is an issue. Uh, the organization that I run, we try to fund uh, strategic litigation on digital rights to make sure that the organizations here in Europe have the resources that they need to put up these fights. But I agree with you that at the moment there's an inequality of arms when it comes to resources. and. Yeah, I, I have to kind of say like, sure, like more cold hard cash would absolutely uh, bring a lot more uh, firepower uh, to the field when it comes to that, particularly given the type of opponents that we're up against. Um, that being said, um, I am uh, always tremendously encouraged and that makes me very optimistic with the dedication and uh, the fire in their belly that the people have who are litigating on these issues, uh, both here across the Atlantic and, and, and also elsewhere. Um, not, being, not, not to say that you know, we have to kind of like fight this fight on sheer willpower. Uh, we need resources. Um, but the dedication is there, and I think that by making sure that they get the right tools that they need and the right resources that they need, we can come pretty far. Hi, um, my name is Emily Black, and I'm from Carnegie Mellon University. First of all, thank you for such a lovely talk. I really, really enjoyed it. Um, I guess if I understood correctly, you were saying that even in the legal discourse, there's kind of a dearth of these red lines of when not to use AI at all. I think that's something that we've been noticing in the tech discourse as well. And in the tech discourse, we've been partially explaining it by saying, oh, well, like big tech is kind of framing our discourse. And that's why the choice to not deploy is often not offered or not in the framing. So I was wondering if you think it's the same forces at play in the legal discourse or if there are other factors as to why um, red lines aren't being talked about, if I understood correctly. Um, you, you understood correctly, <laughs> absolutely. Um, that's a really difficult question uh, uh, to answer. Um, could very well be that the same forces are at play in the sense that the two debates, of course, influence each other. I also think it's a really, really, really hard question, actually. Uh, I've been trying to think of an answer, and I find it really hard to even come to a high-level, vague <laughs> uh, set of parameters for it. But I think that it's one of the tough questions we should stop shying away from, basically, because it really has such practical implications for all of us, uh, for our society and for everyday life, um, that, yeah, I would, I would really love to see us, all of us, like grappling with that in a much more concrete sense. Um, so, yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Michael Veal from UCL, and someone who's bringing several regulatory action, at least trying to, against real-time bidding and data rights in, in the EU. One thing um, that I think is challenging about this space is a bit linked to funding, but also a bit distinct, is really how long a lot of these, take, these cases take. When we see cases about online tracking, we're getting CJU decisions now, really from pop-ups that appeared in 2013. Um, the law has changed since then many times. And even when, uh, what I think is especially worrying in relation to the rule of law, is even then, when the CJU on the facts makes a case that is almost uh, a, a complete reasoning that applies, say, to online tracking, a fashion ID case on embedded Facebook trackers, for example, companies like Facebook and Google say, well, the facts are similar, but we need more clarification. Forever, even, you know, no matter how much a case is exactly on those facts, they can always continue their business model through appeal processes for years and years. So I wonder about the time and the speed of, of, these, kind of uh, these kind of actions, how you see litigation in the digital space keeping up with the need to hold to take accountable fast rather than to let it eke over five, ten years and the business model is changing. Um, the fact that the courts are often very overburdened and overloaded and therefore slow, I, I completely acknowledge, and this is a problem. Um, I do think um, that there, there's two things at play here. One is really kind of making sure that at the outset of the battle you have a proper longer term vision, kind of already threat modeling for these types of situations in which legislation will change and kind of figuring out how you can adapt your plan according to that. But I also think that uh, the connectivity with other efforts can really 
help in making sure that some of these cases go a bit f faster through the system. We've seen the European Court of Human Rights respond pretty quickly uh, to a number of the digital rights cases that have been brought before them because they are made very much aware by everything they read, they hear, etc., that these are very urgent issues. So I think here again, this connectivity with other ways of making noise about an issue uh, and putting it on the, properly on the agenda can also help putting th pushing things forward a little bit more speedily um, than it sometimes goes if you just let it take its natural course. Uh, hey, I'm Ben Green from Harvard, and first I want to thank you for your work and for this talk. Um, I was just sort of wondering, you know, in the United States, the particular conversation that we're having about the courts is that they're lost for a generation, if not longer, given the changes in the Supreme Court, the federal courts, all of that. Um, so, you know, coming from a liberal to left perspective, it's sort of hard to imagine what types of change or wins we'd be able to gain in the Supreme Court or other high courts in the U.S. So. What sort of opportunities do you see for strategic litigation in that environment? What are the challenges and sort of how, how can strategic litigation adapt to that reality to ensure that the goals are not just stymied by unsupportive judges? Very good question. Um, and it applies to a lot of national contexts, right? Not, not only in the US, you will not always have a wonderful Supreme Court to go to uh, as a last resort. Um, there's a couple of things to explore there. One is uh, this idea of kind of chipping away at the block, so making sure that you work towards your goal in a slightly linear way, less linear way, but kind of go about it by taking things in smaller pieces at a time, which are easier even for, for example, very conservative judges to feel comfortable with, and that way you can still, you know, slowly make your, your path towards the goal that you want to achieve. Um, another option is kind of seeing if you can do things at another level, right? Um, so maybe there would be better ways of doing this at a state level and kind of making sure that you don't try to <laughs> go to the Supreme Court necessarily for your, but maybe you can win by numbers, um, so to speak. So you can work on a state level and kind of have what the changes that you're going for spread in that, that way. That's a, those are just kind of some ideas of trying to kind of think a little bit more creatively of how you, how you might get the same results, but in a slightly less direct way, perhaps. Um, I'm going to take a couple of questions from the Etherpad right now, and then we'll go back to the room. Um, so there, there are several questions on here that ask about individual um, harms versus collective harms and individual action versus collection action from different perspectives. Um, for instance, litigation places a huge bur burden on claimants to deliver um, sympathetic narratives. So what can litigants do to use litigation strategically without focusing on individual narratives and raising collective narratives? That's, that's one. Um, another is, are adversarial litigation systems inherently prejudiced when complex algorithmic systems make decisions about individuals? The second one, I, I, I'm not entirely sure that I understand that. Mm -hmm. um, but the first question, yeah, this is, a, this is tough. Um, a lot depends on the circumstances. Very lawyerly answer, very annoying, but um, it depends very much on what individual plaintiffs are willing to do and how much they are willing to put themselves in the spotlight. Um, and it's, 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 let me put it this way. Storytelling is an important part of kind of making a compelling strategic case. Like you, it's, it's about the narrative that surrounds the issue and that can get um, a court to sympathize with your point of view and, and hopefully look more favorable on, upon your legal argument and also getting public support uh, for the issue that you're trying to litigate. Um, and it can be done in different ways. Um, it can be with a focus on an individual, but it could also be sometimes an NGO that represents an interest that the individual kind of represents with the type of human rights violation that they suffered. You can also think of situations in which you can have a group of plaintiffs, right? You soften the blow a little bit by, by putting together kind of a coalition of plaintiffs or claimants. So it, it depends on what you have available. Um, but personally, I'm often quite in favor of making sure that it's not just one person or just two people who are in the spotlight, but kind of building a broader coalition around them to indeed kind of like um, share that burden uh, a little bit more. Thanks. 
Um, I think we'll take two questions at once, just to, to try to get through as many as possible. So go ahead, and then we'll, we'll go over here. Sarah Eskens, University of Amsterdam. So first of all, thank you for your work. I found it very inspiring. Um, my question kind of relates to the question that was just asked online, which is, um, with a lot of the technologies that we are discussing and thinking about at this conference, the harms or the effects on an individual level are often minimal or really hard to prove. So do, what does that mean for strategic litigation? Are these cases, and we're thinking, for example, about how elder, algorithms are used to shape our information environment and how that affects how people are informed and make political decisions, or how algorithms can have discriminatory or racist effects on a group level. Um, but how do we address these these, these cases where the harms on an individual level are really small or hard to prove through strategic litigation, or are these uh, issues just not litigatable? Um, hi, I'm Ella Trobietti from Harvard. Um, thank you so much for this talk. I really appreciate your attempt to, or your call for looking at the present you know, the tools that we already have, and then potentially think about new laws and new solutions. But I just want to push you a little bit on your optimism, um, because I think there are insights from critical scholars that have shown um, that the law can be a tool for the powerful to advance their interests, and that has been consistently the case historically. Um, and so, um, I'm just not sure whether the law and legal strategies can achieve as much or have the potential to address the full extent or many of the issues that we're facing today. So I would be interested in hearing your thoughts. I'll start with that one. It cannot, uh, and I, I would never make that claim. <laughs> I'd like to call myself a realistic optimist. Um, it's Again, it's one of the many tools that we need to use, and uh, I would never I would like to dream it, but I would never claim that just by the law and through litigation we could get where we'd want to be. There's, as you point out, there are so many factors at play, but this is why it's important to kind of make sure that it's part of the arsenal, basically. Uh, on the issue of, um, you're basically raising an issue of evidence, uh, and that is a really important question. What can you prove and what can you not prove? Um, and it's really difficult to uh, give you, like, a one-size-fits-all answer to that. Uh, it very much depends on the context in which you are litigating, what are the standards of proof that are required, etc. And this is where, you know, we need to have really close dialogue with experts such as yourself to understand what we can and cannot actually make visible and make intelligible to a court, and how can we translate what we're seeing into a proper legal argument and what that we can also present evidence for. And then another issue which you didn't ask about, but it's also important, like how do we make judges actually understand uh, what we're telling them? So that's another piece of the puzzle. Hello, Petr Stasis from University of Winchester. Thank you very much for your talk and work. Um, I really like the um, historical background on the incremental changes that uh, occurred in the human rights field. I am wondering how uh, this uh, can be compatible, though, with the exponential growth of technology. And I wonder whether technology uh, pre-shapes the social circumstances and changes the social equation based on which a court will then uh, make these incremental changes. Hi, I'm uh, Robin Burke from the University of Colorado, and uh, thank you for your talk and for your, your activism. So uh, my question is also kind of on the non-optimistic side here. And the people in this room, you know, we're interested in fairness, transparency, and accountability. There are people out there who have an interest in bias, high-handedness, and obfuscation. So, um, and those people also use strategic litigation to get their way. Um, and so I'm just wondering how you think about some of the adversarial issues involved in, in the kind of work you're talking about, uh, because you don't always get to choose what the battlefield is or you know, when you get to intervene. Very true. Uh, these are tools that are uh, at the disposal of all of us. <laughs> and uh, well, in the US in particular, we've seen really interesting developments in uh, more conservative forces using the same techniques that were developed basically by the civil rights movement and, and deploying that to basically push back um, uh, some of the progress that had been made in that context. Um, there's not a lot you can do about that besides also 
putting up your game <laughs> on the other end of the spectrum and uh, making sure that when those cases do present themselves that we fight back with, with all the firepower that we have. But yes, and it, it's there for everyone to use, so uh, also uh, for people that we might disagree with. Yeah, absolutely. And your question was, I think, uh, about the speed in which things are changing and again a little bit like how quick can the courts be in, in, in responding to that. Um, it's, it's a similar answer as I, as I gave earlier, uh, which is trying to kind of like envisage where things might be going to make, perhaps make sure that you line up your case in such a way that it remains relevant uh, as long as possible. Um, and then, yeah, yeah, I, I don't really know what else to add to that, uh, besides trying to think of uh, a way in framing your longer term goals in such a way that they are malleable to the extent that you can still change your position a little bit in your cases, filing multiple cases, etc. Right? There's very, really practical things that you can think of doing, but there's not um, one big answer to that, I'm afraid. Thank you. Um, so I know this is the third question on this kind of point, but um, I just want to take a little different uh, vantage point of the pacing. Um, so I don't know, I guess more historically even, it feels like there's been a failure of law to keep up with the pace of technology even with, say, cars or this sort. So now, you know, the, the world's, Australia's on fire and there's massive climate change, and even if we have laws now to say that, okay, maybe people shouldn't have their own personal private cars, we have this massive road infrastructure. Like, I'm talking from a very American-centric uh, point of view, but we have this massive road infrastructure. We can't really uproot it. And now we're talking about these new technologies. Maybe it seems easier because it's less concrete. It's not just, uh, it'd be easier to uproot, but you know, we're not going to shut down Facebook and all these, if we find a law that needs to say actually most of these apps or most of these companies are no longer viable to exist, uh, it doesn't seem like, my pacing question is, it seems that law has to move at a certain pace to provide some sort of stability, some sort of legal certainty and that makes sense, but if technology moves on a different pace and those paces are routinely at a different pace, will that gap just keep growing and there will keep getting infrastructure that we can't really uproot? Um, yeah. Very good question. Um, so w one of the things that I, that I try to highlight is the way that we can engage with the course in order to apply perhaps slightly out of pace frameworks to a rapidly evolving landscape. Uh, that does require certain efforts though because it also means that we need to equip the courts in such a way that they're able to do that properly. Uh, part of that uh, task lies with us, with the people who will litigate before the courts and making sure that we make um, a clear argument and that we really make it understandable and relatable to them what we're talking about and also show them the way and how we think that existing frameworks can be kind of like applied and, and, and perhaps slightly turned a little bit on their head in order to, to apply to the situation that we want to challenge. Um, but it also means that there needs to be sufficient, uh, there needs to be a sufficient investment in making sure that uh, judges are trained properly and that they're sensitized to all of these issues so that they're better capable also when perhaps slightly less tech savvy litigants uh, appear before them to kind of make that translation switch. Um, so there's, there's also kind of in a way um, a policy decision uh, from governments in, to the extent in which they want to actually invest in the capacity of our courts to be able to deal with these things. Because you're, you're absolutely right, there's always going to be a little bit of a time lag and it could be a bigger one or a smaller one, but uh, that's one that definitely needs to be bridged. And I'm just going to take moderator privilege and follow that up with another question from the Etherpad, which is, um, which is also kind of goes back to this idea that like law is slow and this, this is a slow and, and long process. And so the question on the etherpad is, um, what about policy levers that are available beyond new or existing law? Um, this highlights the potential for worker action as a way of affecting reputation um, and standards. Um, so 
the question is, what are, what are the other options to affect policy beyond law? Um, and how do we choose between them? How do we know when the right time is to pursue a legal strategy and when the right time is to pursue an outside strategy? Well, that's actually a question for those who actually engage in policy work, <laughs> which is not me. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I, I don't know how to give a one-size-fits-all answer to that. Um, yeah, other than repeating what I said before, so sorry about that. <laughs> Discussed at lunch. Um, Doris. Uh, th thank you, Nani, for a great, uh, for a great talk and, and, and compliments also to the conference for, for having you here and promoting DFF's uh, work. I, I have a question on uh, stakeholder responses in the European uh, like legal system. And I mean, I, I imagine like you, you, you may have something to say about how the work of your organization is being received. I'm thinking also in particular about the types of organizations that it should be maybe doing the work that now the, the civil society stakeholders are doing. And for example, in the area of data retention, this is like this, the mandatory um, blanket retention of electronic communications data by, um, uh, by telecommunications providers. Um, the European Commission maybe should be doing some of the work that now civil society actors is doing. Eu European Commission has the possibility to start infringement procedures to go after member states if they keep adopting illegal laws uh, in this area. Data protection authorities are not always uh, doing the work that they maybe should be doing. So I imagine maybe from those areas you get very positive responses uh, about the work that is being done by DFF and also the organizations that you're funding. Uh, but do you, do you agree that there's maybe a tension point where we need to also push on some of the existing kind of institutions to do some of the work that now in the end strategic litigation from civil society is doing? Yes, I would agree with that. Um, and I would also say that uh, I, I wouldn't expect that um, those who are trying to nudge through filing complaints, etc., DPAs into action, expect that that is their way of taking over their job. In a way, it's actually trying to ignite them to do what they're supposed to be doing, right? Um, so it's kind of giving a, a push in the right direction, and hopefully, like once you know that has switched into gear, civil society can focus on, on something else. Uh, the commission is an interesting uh, point. It's also really interesting because they've been debating for a very long time, right? This idea of investing more in strategic litigation. Uh, but I think quite soon uh, ran into the issue that they might be funding litigation against their own member states, um, which made it a little bit complicated. <laughs> I think that's maybe one of the reasons why that has stalled a little bit. Um, and it's an interesting question, like what are the motivations behind this indeed? And, and should perhaps equal attention be paid to actually getting the mechanisms that are in place to work more efficiently and, and, and more effectively? Good point. Great, okay, well thank you so much, Nani. That was a great discussion and a great talk and I think we are breaking for lunch, right? Thanks.